When will we have a backup of the planet? Welcome to Tech First with John Kutsir. Right now we're stuck in our homes. Uh, we've got quarantines, we've got stay at home, shelter in place. It's kind of a VR moment if you think about it. Virtual reality is taking off. Uh, Facebook's Oculus Quest was sold out. I saw that the HTC Vive was sold out as well. Well, one company in New Zealand is developing some very cool new tools to virtually recreate real physical locations uh, and actually visit them as well, uh, which would be nice these days. To chat more about this, I want to bring on the creative visionary officer of Reality Virtual, Simon Chedebor. Simon, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Going very well, thank you. I, I got to start here. Uh, coronavirus is the biggest fact in our lives right now. How are you feeling? Uh, how's it going in New Zealand? And, and are you safe? Um, we're doing really well. Uh, Jacinta has just been incredible. She's just, uh, we've all been quite moved, to be honest. Uh, feel a little guilty. We're, we're we've are we been blessed. I mean, we're, we're dropping fast. We're, I think we're one of the only Western nations that are really actually intent on eliminating it completely. That would so, be amazing. I did see yeah. that. Your, I did see that your prime minister took a pay cut along with, I think, some yeah. other MPs as kind of, I guess, an example of spreading the the difficulties or the challenges of yes. the current yes. situation, um, which was nice to see as well. And um, of course, you're pretty isolated. There's a lot of people who seem to have a bolt hole, uh, an apocalypse bolt hole in New Zealand these days. Yeah, Queenstown's the place. Queenstown, there seems to be a few people um, parked up there, a few celebrities, uh, celebrities <laughs> and whatnot. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, excellent. Let's jump right into it. Uh, you've said that you wanted to back up the planet. Um, could th talk about what that means, what that sound, what 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 that involves. Um, okay, wow, it's quite quite a long story to actually get there and get it in a, an efficient and successive way. Uh, but basically, we're looking at kind of open sourcing mass adoption of photographs from parties on the ground, and essentially automating the process mostly through AI, so we can actually quickly create these environments uh, successively without the kind of the huge overhead and the huge amount of labor involved. Um, teaching computers to push pixels. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, automation. It's gonna allow us to it. Interesting, so, so, so that we can understand exactly what you're doing, talk yeah. to us about the process that you had to go through to virtualize an environment, let's say a year ago, or maybe a couple years okay. ago. Okay. How, how hard was that? Well, um, we've always been quite a bit quicker because we, we kind of built a lot of internal tools to help us with um, uh, I might get a bit technical here, but techniques with baking and um, extrapolation of all the data, all the point cloud. Uh, essentially, I'll, I'll use Nefertari as an example, so Queen Nefertari in Egypt. Um, about two years ago, I was flying there single-handedly. Uh, it was probably the longest flight I've ever taken in, in, in duration, 27 hours in total. Um, wow. Finally, finally get the Lux, uh, finally get the Valley of the Queens. Uh, eight hours in a tomb with a specialized camera and, and, and flash uh, technique. And uh, it was just crazy. Like, just I was down there for eight hours. There was five, six, um, five um, AK-47 guys above uh, guarding the place, and you know, just in this amazing tomb for eight hours, taking the photos. Took about four thousand photographs. Um, then flew back to New Zealand. Uh, took it home, processed it. Uh, took the team, about three of us, about six weeks. Now, the wow. fact that though about. Five of those six weeks is just one task for one person, which is called retopology. And that is a nightmare. So one of our biggest next steps that we're aiming for is automated retopology using AI. So just from that alone, we can take a six week processing time down to one week. Um, so when we get it here, we have a whole bunch of post-process techniques that we use to actually enhance the environment. So traditionally speaking, when you go capture one of these environments, you're stuck with um, baked lighting or the objects that are in the scene, like with Nevertai, it was uh, floorboards and halogen lighting, which is horrible. Um, so we use AI, uh, similar techniques to content aware fill in Photoshop, actually, uh, to essentially lasso around areas that we're not, that we don't want. Yes. And, and it will fill it in with what we do want. Yes. So that's one of the many techniques, um, super sampling, you know, extrapolating as much data as possible from what you get and filling in areas where you had occlusion, like areas that you missed, 
And we've basically automated most of these processes. Uh, and so we're able to deal with, you know, 24 billion points of detail, billion, that's with a B, yes. um, as a post-process technique, which to the best of our knowledge, uh, we haven't really seen anyone else do. Super interesting. So yeah. let's dive into that just a little bit deeper. You yeah. you went to Egypt. You went to Nefertiti's tomb. You took mm -hmm. 4,000 pictures. Uh, yeah. Did you follow a process for taking those 4,000 pictures? Did you go in randomly and just snap everything you could possibly think of? Did you have to follow a certain path? Or how did you do that? Spatial awareness is good. Uh, for me personally, <laughs> I have good spatial awareness. I um, actually don't laugh. I'm legally blind. 5% uh, one eye. 2.5 wow. another. And so I actually need to have my special awareness always. And so I, I map out my environments as it is. Wow. And so, um, yeah, special awareness is good. You need to know where you've been. You need to know where you've covered. We yeah. can actually process that live so we can see a, a, a draft point cloud showing us where we need to, you know, kind of go and stuff. Um, but yeah, you, just, you don't want to take randomly, just any any good photo, you know, any good photo, but yes. random is okay, just coverage. Coverage is everything. So Yes. And yeah. so now you've got it down to you said something like a week for one person, but before when you actually that that was that was three, four weeks for, for five or six people, is that correct? Well, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say I mean every time we do a project, we basically treat it like an R and D project. So we build tools as we go. And we did, definitely did that with Nefertari and Tudum Carmen. Um and so we get quicker, but then we find new things we want to extrapolate or new ways of enhancing it. So we then get slower again because we, we don't want to do this as like work for hire. We're really trying to work out the best possible pipeline. Nice. Um, but generally speaking, I do believe we'll get it down to a week, one or two people, once we resolve retopology. Retopology is just such a pushing pixels task. It's the only task that's really taking us ages. Um, because all of, all of, oh, sorry, all of our other tasks are based, you know, we, we use deep learning to extrapolate all this information that otherwise an artist would have to put in manually, like yeah. roughness and all this other kind of stuff, roughness and in painting and yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It would be amazing if uh, someday it's as simple as the Google mapping car driving around or the Apple Maps car driving around, taking pictures yeah. the whole time and just mapping it together kind of almost in real time. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, there's a lot of people on the ground. And the way we really want to shape this is we, we you know, to get back to backing up the planet, we're talking about like an artist rights management system, kind of a, like a, uh, I guess where you get paid royalties, like if you do an album, like, um, you know, you, you get paid a check occasionally for how much airplay you get. So we really want to get people on the ground taking the photos and having their location and, you know, their geotag or their um, ID free, um, uh, EXIF data embedded yes. into it. Um, so if a studio or a university or, you know, Polytechnic or, you know, studio for virtual studio production or any kind of educational facility actually wants to then use these environments, uh, essentially, the original artist who took the original photos actually gets a cut of that from the licensing. And so this is how we see it as actually a way of, you know, I can't be everywhere at once. I mean, the last three years I've flown like 120 times and I fucking hate, oh, sorry, I hate flying. I don't mean to swear. We, we swear a lot in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> so you're like Aussies is what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're a bit liberal on that front. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the whole idea is that we want to scale this up. And the only way you can scale this up is actually by having a lot of people on the ground acquisitioning the data and then that data being backed up and stored in a kind of a artist rights management slash heritage trust type archive. We don't want individual companies hoarding this stuff. We've seen really bad examples from players that I will not mention in the past that have not done well on actually um, doing this for the greater good. and. I love that. I absolutely love that. That's amazing because uh, that's been a big point of contention lately, right? Which is that uh, if you look at mapping data, what, what there's 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 five to six companies globally that yeah. have ninety seven percent of that mapping data, right? And if we're looking at recreating the Earth in VR, um, you know, having some kind of open source or at least some kind of uh, foundation that 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 manages that and and people can contribute to that sort of like a Wikipedia of the planet, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Absolutely. So crowdsourcing the data, um, you know, having it peer distributed or, you know, I mean, 
maybe not. I mean, we're pretty tight with Amazon Web Services right now. They were very generous with um, providing a storage and GPU process. So, but we do, you know, sorry, mic drop there, but you know what I mean. Uh, we do want to definitely find a way to have the data in multiple locations, um, very much like the internet in itself. Yes. So peer to peer kind of does work in our favor. Um, that's for the archival purpose. Uh, so if someone's, you know, we, we produce these environments and everyone actually gets them on Steam for free, like literally, you know, but they get processed when a studio or university would like to access that environment for whatever reason, the studio is then able to license and use it for their specific task or the university is able to use it for an educational thing where they're able to add on educational elements themselves. Mm -hmm. But the actual environment itself will always be available to the public. Wow. As, as it is, you know, auditory and visual, as if you're just there. Nice. And, yeah. Nice. Talk about a few of the places that you've done already. Uh, you mentioned uh, some places in, in, in Egypt, uh, his archaeological sites. What yeah. other places have you done as well? Um, so Tutum Carmen was cool, King Tut. Uh, we did that. Um, uh, City Lights recently used it for an educational museum experience. Um, uh, it actually won a Lumia Award um, in 2020. So I have to, that's little, awesome. Uh, Congratulations. Pretty, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't even know about it. I heard about it like from a friend. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, but hey, go LA. Um, but it was cool. Um, I have to I have to ping in on that one because yeah. I happened to be in Cairo. I think it was probably about eight years ago or something like that. Right, right. And a bunch of us that were at the conference, we went to the National um, Museum where Tutankhamun is. Yeah. And 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 we literally we literally stood there for ten minutes in front mm -hmm. of Tutankhamun and yeah. and just in, in awe, speechless amazing glorious beautiful yeah. you must have had much more time i mean i wonder uh, how many pictures you took oh my gosh um i had never um we did a few other mummies uh as well and i can tell you the weirdest thing is actually mummies they, they lifted the the thing that keeps it in, in protection and uh the whole the room the lid yeah the whole room just filled with this amazing smell of um and a seed or something. It was oh, crazy. Spices. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Like spices, man. After after all these thousands of years, it was wow. really, really quite something. So the whole experience in Egypt. I've been there a few times now. I went there last year and did the whole red carpet at the Cairo International Film Festival, which was just surreal. I mean, coming from New Zealand and coming from a small town of like eighteen thousand to doing red carpet stuff was like, okay, this is kind of weird. Um, but uh, it was it was. Um, Egypt is cool, and I really want to get down there, get more sites done. Uh, we've got good people on the ground that we really want to actually help us with this. Um, but yeah, so we've got Egypt. Uh, I was, me and my CPO were in the Large Hydron Collider about eight months ago. So that Where, was cool. sorry, can you repeat that? The Large Hydron Collider. Oh, wow, that must be amazing. Yeah, 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 100 meters underground, rolling around in a bit of radiation. Uh, don't scratch your nose. Um, yeah. Why? Uh, it's such a it's such an amazing machine. Um, but yeah, we've done St. Matthew's Cathedral here in New Zealand. We've done some beautiful beach locations here in New Zealand. Um, I'm sorry, we're going a bit brain daft right now in the locations. We've no, done, it's but, no worry. It, it's uh, all good, but I'm wondering why you can't scratch your nose in the Large Hadron uh, Collider. Right. Um, well, when the machine's on, it releases a lot of radiation and dust. Yes. So when they turn the machine off, it was, it was terrifying because they told us this at the end. They're like, we hope you didn't scratch your nose or your bum. And I'm like, why? <laughs> you know? And they're like, yeah, they're just like, yeah, because it's this fine particle dust. So you have to put your hands on this um, machine that tests you. And yeah. Okay. Um, so that dust could be radioactive and you yeah, don't want to transfer yeah. it to some part of yourself and walk out yes. with it and continue yes. irradiating yourself. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. But, um, so you find yourself in these crazy positions where you, you know, you're, running around and you know you're being asked to like scan Tutankhamun's shoes or something and you're yes. just like 
please, people don't move a thing. I don't want to stand on anything. You know, <laughs> the first question is like, I always ask is, do you have liability insurance? You know? <laughs> That's very comforting. I'm sure you come to the Cairo Museum and you ask, do you have liability insurance? Well, sir, we can't quite replace this mummy. Yeah. It's the only one yeah, know, in existence. It's a, it's, a running, it's a running joke, but oh, I, I just man. Know, like, myself in these positions, man. It's um, The last four years has just been crazy. So. Yeah. So you're creating something new right now, and it's kind yeah. of relevant to where we are in yeah. quarantine times. Um, you're creating some real-time immersive teleconferencing. Uh, yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that is, uh, what it looks like, how it works, um, and what it feels yeah. like to use it? Well, I mean, it, it came out of necessity, and the necessity being the current situation. So we had been playing with volumetric video and RGBD video for quite a few years, and we had it running on mobile, and we had it running under 4G, which we thought was pretty remarkable in itself. Um, most volumetric solutions are gigabytes for a minute. We're talking about 100 megabytes a minute. Um, we have had a technique that was relightable, so you could, we could scan someone with uh, some connects, and remove all the lighting and add high level normal maps and all the little features and wrinkles and stuff. Yes. So we relight the person in post and, you know, an Unreal Engine. And so we've been seeing this for years and it just got no traction. We couldn't work out why because we, you know, we saw the others, other parties, I won't mention names, I don't want to, you know, they're all friends of mine. Um, but they're, they're using solutions that are just, in my opinion, heavy for one. Two, you need a massive studio of like 100 cameras. And that's just crazy. Uh, because most indie studios do not have access to that kind of stuff. And so we wanted to find a lightweight solution. Um, and so we've just been sitting on this and we'd also been sitting on deep PBR, deep physically based rendering, which can look at an image and extrapolate depth maps and roughness and high level normal maps and completely delight it in, you know, in, in seconds, right? Um, from a, a reference image or texture. So we have these two technologies. One is volumetric video that's lightweight and two is this process of real time uh, texture extrapolation from any standard reference photo or, or camera. Um, and so that the second tool is really good for texture artists. I mean, a, a traditional artist would take like eight hours to fudge a texture for a game. We're talking about an individual being able to make like, you know, a whole library of textures in a day, depending on how many photographs they can take. But we got DPBR working so fast that we genuinely believe we can work it in real time. Wow. And so where we, where we can go with this, is, is we have a camera, right? And from the, from the image you see of me right now, I'm able to extrapolate a 3D depth map of where my hand is, right? And all this kind of stuff. I'm able to remove the lighting from my face and I'm able to crop out the background. And so if I can do that in real time and you can do that in real time, as we are right now, when I do this and I'm looking at you, I'm seeing parallax of your face. Yes. But I'm also seeing the lighting. Well, I'm seeing the lighting in my room cast onto you. Yes. You're seeing the lighting in your room cast onto me. And we're in each other's space because we can do facial tracking at the same time. So when I'm doing this, I'm actually pivoting to the side of your head. Yes. Uh, and you can see I'm pivoting. So we actually introduce direct eye contact because we can adjust for the camera's position versus the monitor. That is amazing. So somebody's not staring at the camera on their, their yes, webcam, they're the staring camera. at your eyes. Yes. But the lighting, you know, the lighting, the fact that we can extrapolate high resolution normal maps from training data, D-Light, all those things. We really make you feel like you're with me. We really make me feel like I'm with you. Hence, we describe it as like talking to a mirror, but with someone else there. Yes. Or a sheet of glass. I mean, we call it white mirror. It's a cheesy name, I know. But we only, we only realized we could do this literally weeks ago when the crisis took place. And we're like, well, we can marry these things. We can literally put our pre-existing technologies together to actually push this new thing in a time of crisis. Yeah, that is very cool. And I yeah. guess the question is, where are you with that? And, and where are you in terms of commercialization of that? We, if we pushed hard, I mean, we've recently, Epic Games have been awesome. We recently got a mega grant, which was amazing. Uh, we've been terribly underfunded here, uh, you know, and we'll be doing project by project for our R&D, right? Yes. Uh, with this mega grant, you know, the team, we, we're sufficient for a year solid. Wow. Uh, but we want to scale up. So we're going to actually push hard with us, try and see if we can get additional funding, additional grants to push this technology as fast as we can, because it's a crisis that is now. So we yep. want to get more people on the ground now. We're one of the few companies in New Zealand 
who's going to be massively hiring uh, in this in this scenario, which is crazy. Yes. So, yes. Um, but we, we think that we need to get us out of mumps. I want to see this out in July. I know that's stupendously ambitious, but we it is marrying pre-existing technologies we have. We just need to get uh, you know a few additional developers on the ground to fast pace the the Python. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and the TensorFlow and, and, and uh, actually get busy training on data. So, you know, I, I made a port of call on the internet uh, about a week ago. There's a whole bunch of Azure connects and Windows connects for our depth training just sitting there as dropped off as yesterday. So nice. we're, just running, we're just running with it, man. Like this nice. was something that came about that we pivoted to. And because we are a lean startup, we could pivot fast and go, hey, guys, let's just push DPBR and these other things to the side for the moment. Let's focus on this, make this happen as soon as possible. We'll get back to that in a bit. Very, very cool. Yeah. Talk yeah. about that grant from Epic, um, about that program a little bit and, yeah. and why you applied and, and what you got and what you're using it for. Can't say what I got. Uh, I, can <laughs> it's you, secret, I, can, huh? I can tell you, it, 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 I, you know, we can now afford a house in Auckland, though, <laughs> or something like that. You know what I mean? So, uh, and Auckland's pretty, um, I don't know if you know Auckland, it's one of the more expensive cities in the world. Um, good lifestyle, very good lifestyle. Um, right. Yeah, I missed the bars. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyhow, anyhow, um, yeah, so we, we applied about a year ago. Um, it took a while. Um, you, you, but that's okay. Uh, you know, they, they, they got to us at a time of need, which is great. Um, you know, the timing honestly couldn't have been better. Good. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I love those guys. Um, you know, I know a lot of them personally while doing the talking circuit itself by Southwest, you know, DDC, GTC, yeah. Graph, all that kind of jazz. All those places that don't exist anymore. Oh, dude, this year my calendar, boom, I just, oh my gosh. I mean, I was but meant to be- how productive you're going to be. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, I was meant to be in Shanghai on the 17th to propose. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck with that. But that didn't happen. <laughs> Yeah, so, I have the same thing. I'm I'm off. I, I, I'm not sure I've spent so long in one city for about a decade, honestly. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, don't think yeah. I have. Um, th there's some benefits. I feel like I have a normal job. <laughs> I feel like a regular wage earning person um, who, you know, works at a job that is in a place and goes to the place. And uh, so there are some benefits there and I'm seeing my family all the time. So that's good. But obviously it's a really challenging time for the world. And, um, and we, you know, we're, that's a small sacrifice that we're making um, that, uh, that others are making a much greater sacrifice for. Well, super interesting. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about your technology. You, 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 you mentioned it a little bit. Uh, you're using a ton of AI here, you're using a ton of machine learning. Yeah. Um, and, and that's how you're getting faster. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, the, the breakthroughs you've had there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, um, you know, it was we're in a good position because we're doing photogrammetry to begin with. Um, photogrammetry, obviously, the technique of point cloud acquisition um, from photographs, right? Yes. It requires a whole bunch of NVIDIA GPUs. Um, NVIDIA were kind enough to just give us powerful, massive cards. Um, and so when we pivoted from photogrammetry, we didn't really pivot, but when we wanted to jump into deep learning a few years ago, we already had a lot of the processing power at our disposal. So um, we were able to jump in fast, but we also had a lot of data. So we'd done all this photogrammetry, all this light extrapolation, delighting, all these other techniques. Unlike a lot of other players who don't have the data, we were sitting on millions of photographs. And so that gave us a good head start. Um, and then we just cracked at it. Like we're, you know, technically we're like, well, we were just five guys in this rather large hacker block, um, running around, you know, um, smoking cigs out the window and drinking red wine while coding at night. And, uh, <laughs> it's all empty now, but you know, um, and so we've just been hacking, we've just been hacking at it for a few years and picked up on the Python and obviously TensorFlow 2.0 has introduced some great, um, some great performance boosts, uh, Tensor Core, all these other technologies are allowing us to, you know, get this fast. We're able to batch operate at pretty reasonable resolutions, you know, at what is definitely frame, uh, you know, 60 to 90 frame rate ready for yes. single, single GANs. Now, the, 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 the trick with this to getting this really working is going to be 
just more and more opt optimization to combine those GANs into a single GAN. So, you know, where we give it one input, we are wanting four or five outputs at varying levels. Now, we've got that independently, but we're going to have to merge that together. Yes. But we know, it can be, we know it can be done. Yes. Um, and so it's going to be that in combination with literally just acquisitioning more depth map information data, which we have, you know, of a lot of leaves and a lot of bricks and a lot of rocks, but we don't really have much of faces. <laughs> and so we're now on a big uh, pillage to find as much face data as we can. But Well, you've got Tutankhamun. Kamun. Yeah, right. We'll make everyone look like Tutankhamun. and Kamun. Why not? <laughs> um, so Everybody yeah. is gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the face data acquisition is easy. You know, an Azure Connect gets a 1024 by 1024 resolution image at 15 frames a second. Yes. You know, and we've got a bunch of these and we've got a bunch more coming in. We've got a bunch of guys and they've got a bunch of flatmates in their bubble. So we're literally going to get all of us and anyone in our immediate bubble here in New Zealand to jump in front of the camera and acquisition this data over the next few weeks. Uh, and if there's any open source data we can access as well, or if anyone wants to jump in for us, some of these There are some data. open source databases yeah. of faces as well, I think that you can yeah. grab and yeah. use. And that'll be yeah. useful as well, because you'll have some level of, of, of diversity, obviously, where you are in New yeah. Zealand, but you won't have full on diversity from all no, over North America, no, South America. We are, we are country wise, we're actually one of the most diverse populations on the planet. Really? Um, oh, yeah, shit, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, shivers, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, no, Auckland in particular, like, we're, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say we're the most diverse, but we're definitely up there. Um, I mean, we are an island in the middle of nowhere, and we are an island of immigrants. I mean, yes, obviously, apart from the indigenous Maori, um, you know, we have a, it's a, yeah, it's a really unique place, man. Um, you know, we're Kiwis, we're not European, we're not white, we're not African American, we're just Kiwis, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, and apparently I'm the Tigerian one. So wonderful. Um, yeah. Um, so, well, yeah. One thing I wanted to ask was about that actually, and yeah. and uh, just about the tech scene in New Zealand. Uh, we don't hear a ton about tech companies from New Zealand. Oh. Yeah. Um, you obviously are with one, run one in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. What's the tech scene like there? Um, what, what's well, happening? Yeah. Look, honestly, we need to work on it. Um, and I think this is another great thing that Epic Games has done by giving us this grant. And NVIDIA and AWS, you know, we've been gifted close to a mill of just resource, right? And I think that's really going to trigger local body politics here in New Zealand. And I'm pushing hard for that because uh, it has been hard for us. Uh, we, we kind of live in Weta's shadow. Uh, Weta Digital being, you know, yes. a pretty established uh, tech company. Um, and so as a VFX R&D company ourselves, we, you know, we, we fall between the, cra um, the cracks, but we've um, definitely had more coverage abroad than we've had locally, um, but we're working on that. Oh, and wow. so I'm talking to parties and, and, and government and whatnot to make the case that they need to kind of move towards um, the, the younger generation in New Zealand who have actually started to crack this, because it, it is a bit of a boys club right now. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a small country at two degrees, you know, people know each other. So good, good, good. Yeah. good. I yeah. have to ask. Yeah. I have to ask because I'm seen in the background. I'm going to solo you on the video here. I see that oh, you're no. in the VIP area. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, was using to, I was using that to hide my cables under the desk. Hide your what? Sorry. Hide the cables under the desk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, just a bit of framing. I, I do a lot of video as well, so I get really awkward about um, having the shot look right and. Stuff like that. So well, I've got it looks pretty good. I've it looks like nice user over here just to soften the light and yeah, you know. it looks pretty but, good. I, I I like I like your office. I like the art in the background. The VIP area looks like it's a bit of an indoor gym as well. I see. Yeah, some. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just a massive lounge. I'd love to show you around the house. We've got you know a nice kitchen island. We've got a beautiful uh, view outside. That's massive trees and uh, you can pretty much see the sky tower out our, um, out our window. So wonderful. We're right, we're right in the city. Um, this, this is actually the old sanitarium, sanitarium building, uh, Wheat Bix. I don't know if you know what Wheat Bix is, but the old Wheat Bix building. Um, do you guys have Wheat Bix? I don't know what you call it. I have uh, no idea what you're talking about. No, oh, it's okay. Wheat Bix. <laughs> is that a cereal? <laughs> it's a cereal, yeah. So um, this, this is an old office conversion that um, kind of warehouse the office that is like a work live. And basically, we've just all got the building to um, 
to jam and um, make stuff. Yeah. Well, excellent. Uh, Simon, I want to thank you for coming on for this. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been uh, it's super interesting to find out what you're working on, uh, how it's going. Thank you for taking some time. No, no, it's been wonderful. Uh, happy to talk anytime. It's been wonderful. Blast. Wonderful. And for everybody else who's been along, thank you for joining us on Tech First. My name is John Katsir. I appreciate you being along for the ride. Whatever platform you're on, uh, please like, subscribe, share, comment, all of the above. If you're on the podcast later on, you like this, please rate it, review it. That would be a massive help. Thank you so much. Until next time, this is John Katsir with Tech First. Oops.